This is From Both Sides, a spontaneous, free-flowing conversation featuring a dynamic team of women, providing insights into both political and civic events affecting the lives of women throughout Pennsylvania. And now, here's your host. Hello, and welcome to a new edition of From Both Sides. I'm Michelle Salato, your host, and today we have a great show about women and philanthropy. But before we begin, I'd like to introduce our co-host today. Um, she you might recognize her from being the co-host on Behind the Headlines, and more importantly, she's an FOM, friend of Michelle. I'd like to introduce Maura Donnelly. Maura? Hello, Michelle. Hi, thanks for being here. Well, thank you very much for having me. I'm looking forward to our discussion. Um, today we're going to talk about philanthropy. And when we think about a philanthropist, we think about someone who donates their time, their effort, and generally some pretty significant financial resources to the welfare of others and to good causes. Today we have a woman who exemplifies the definition of philanthropist. It's my pleasure to introduce today Jeannie Arnold. Jeannie, welcome. Thank you, Michelle. It's great Thank to you have you here. Me. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to start off, Jeannie, by saying Wow, you have done it all. I almost don't know where to start, but I'm going to start by just naming a few of the causes that you've supported. Um, Penn State Hershey Medical Center, the Children's Hospital, United Way, Domestic Violence, the Alliance Project, Early Learning, and the National Boy Scouts of America, which is one I really want to get back and talk to. So I would like to delineate all of your causes, but if we did, we wouldn't have time for the show. We'd still be listing them. Um, so your, your philanthropic work is so uh, extensive. Could you just start out by giving the viewers a little bit of a sense of your background and kind of how you came along this journey to uh, arrive where you are today? Well, my background is I'm a native of Rhode Island and uh, lived in a small town called Forster, Rhode Island. My mother worked for a physician, and my father was a mechanic at a printing pr uh, press plant in Providence, Rhode Island. I always wanted to be a nurse. That was what my career was. So I went to Rhode Island Hospital School of Nursing and graduated from there as an RN with a diploma. And from that point on, continued to work in my career at different levels, first as a staff nurse, then as a assistant head nurse, then a head nurse and then eventually was asked to be an assistant director of, of nursing and then finished with my final career which was senior vice president of patient care services at the Good Samaritan Hospital in Lebanon where I met my husband Edward Arnold. Oh that's wonderful. Yes. That's that's a um, how did you get from Rhode Island down here was were you making career moves and uh, while I mean while you were doing career advancement were were you moving around? I had gone from Rhode Island to Pittsburgh when I was married before. We won't talk about that. Okay. <laughs> uh, that's not a good story. But anyway, I so I was in Pittsburgh okay. and then relocated to the Lancaster area, not because of my career, but because of my ex-husband's career. Okay. And I went to work at Lancaster General Hospital and then from there at Saint, to St. Joe's as Assistant Director of Nursing and then uh, Ephrata Hospital as Chief Nursing Officer and Operations and then from there to the Good Samaritan Hospital. Well, Jeannie, um, we talk a lot about politics on this show, and it occurs to me that often when women get involved in political pursuits, it's because there's some uh, passion or some issue that has, uh, you know, driven that. Mm -hmm. And I'm just kind of wondering, what, what first caused you to be motivated to get so involved with philanthropy? Well, I think it, it basically was because of needs that, you know, when I was at the Good Samaritan Hospital, we did a community needs assessment. And uh, I was there as the senior vice president. And basically, after we got the results from uh, a, a firm, Trip Umbach from Pittsburgh, we got the results of what the problems and issues were in our community, I was given the responsibility of responding to what we could for these issues. So I set up a number of committees, not only with hospital people, but also community people, and dealing with mental health issues, uh, obstetrics, youth, the senior citizens, it was, it was really the whole gamut and got very involved in those and from that became aware of what the needs were. And then when I was in a position as I am now with a, a wonderful husband where I could help, then the financial resources and his support was there to, uh, to move forward and help in, with some of the issues. 
So I was asked to be on a number of boards. I served on those boards and, uh, you know, became supportive of, of ones that I really felt that really touched my heart. Mm -hmm. So which ones do touch your heart the most? Well, I think my, my most um, passion is for the Hummingbird program at the Children's Hospital at the Hershey Medical Center. And this goes along with my own philosophy where when I was at Good Samaritan, I had a program called the Connection Delivery Model. And it was where I had nurses that were cross-trained to do hospital care and home care. And we were able to follow patients based on diagnosis. And so they were followed in the hospital and at home. And this provided a continuum of care rather than episodic care. And the f same philosophy is what the Hummingbird Program is all about, where these children have life-threatening conditions. Ed and I met with mothers that have gone through just tremendous problems with these very critically ill patients. And this program really oversees and provides care and oversight for inpatient as well as outpatient for these children. It results in less readmissions to the hospital, quality of life issues, better patient care, and there's a team that is constantly monitoring them. So if the children have to come back into the hospital, they don't have to tell their story over yeah, and you over. You don't have to start from the square one. The team knows right. it. Yeah. You know, and that's so much more efficient. You know, it seems like that model ought to be used in other areas, too. <laughs> um, from having my mother, who lived with me for many years, having some serious medical issues in the last few years of her life, it seems like that type of approach would have been beneficial for her as well. So I don't know if they do any of that for seniors, but it certainly would be something that I think they should follow your example of the Hummingbird Program. I think, I think it's a perfect model, mm -hmm. and it really benefits so much the patient, the family, and, and it's beneficial back to the hospital because of, you know, keeping costs in line. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that many of the HMOs and different healthcare providers are trying to do that. I know our personal family physician tries to do that in his office setting, mm -hmm. so it's, it is helpful. So if an organization approaches you um, or has you come in to learn more about them, do you have a certain set of criteria that you look to in, in, in order to make a determination of whether you'd like to support it? Or do, do you just have to be touched in your heart? Is there any, wh what goes on? What's the thought process in, well, it's in funny. helping an organization? It's funny because my husband says, I never met a charity I didn't like. <laughs> so there's no criteria. <laughs> well, <laughs> They're, Be they're, careful, you may get a lot of phone calls yeah, after right, the show. Right, right. <laughs> um, I think if the story really touches our hearts mm -hmm. and we know the need is there, that uh, most of the time we'll find a way to do what we can to help. And, you know, I'm not just mm -hmm. a person that gives money to an organization. I like to get involved, you know, to really feel what's going on and know what's going on, to, to just write a check to, an, to a facility. It, to me, doesn't tell the whole story. Mm -hmm. You really have to get in there at different levels to understand what they're doing. Well, and I think that's really what makes you unique and um, a blessing to many of the communities around here because it's very easy to write a check. Mm -hmm. um, anybody could do it in varying denominations, but to be actively involved and to believe in the mission and to be passionate about what they're doing, I think it really sets you apart from, from others in, in the area. Thank you, Maura. Yeah. I, yes, I mean, I do enjoy it. It gives me, you know, it's really one of the reasons I enjoy so much giving to organizations mm -hmm. because it provides that involvement. But, but basically, the beginning of your philanthropic work was an offset of your, your professional work, your profession in nursing and in, in medical care for people. Right, right. right. It, it started that way, and what I could do, of course, I was single at that time, uh, but when I was involved in some of the organizations, I, I gave whatever I could. Mm -hmm. So it's always been a philosophy, you mm -hmm. know, and I remember with my mother and father, I mean, they didn't make, they were basically, you know, uh, blue-collar workers, but w if we'd go to a restaurant or something, my father was an extremely generous uh, tipper, and he was also an electrician, so he would wire houses for people. I mean, so that was kind of a philosophy that I grew up with. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a, that's a really good point because your father would give of his time, which can be just as valuable as writing a check, and I think that's yeah. what a lot of young people need to learn, that it doesn't have to be um, money. You can donate your time. Absolutely. Which people do volunteer work, which is 
and it can be just as valuable to an organization as, as writing a check for them. Oh, I, I totally agree with that. I think volunteering and helping in many ways is another way of, of giving a different type of capital, your own personal capital, mm -hmm. that you're taking the time to do that. And then ultimately, as you progress and become more in a, you know, an area where you can donate, that's the organization mm -hmm. that you're going to be you're going to be giving to. Now, Jeannie, how do you and your husband decide uh, who who is going to make the decision, who's giving, deciding which uh, charity to give to? How does that work? You told me a little bit about that earlier when we were talking about going to events and uh, being recognized and so on. Well, I think that uh, we we work very well together. He's very understanding. If I that helps, yeah. yeah. <laughs> You know, if I go to him and tell him, you know, I really would like to do such and such for an organization, I mean, he'll think about, you know, he'll think about it and get back to me. I have to, in all honesty, admit that there are times that I do make a commitment and will go to an event and he'll look at me and say, did we do that? <laughs> and I'll say, yeah, I, I so you, think I told so you, you. you apologize later. Yeah, I, and I, I'm always forgiven, you yeah. know, I, I'm of always course. forgiven, you know, but I don't try to take advantage of that but you know if I think it's something that really is going to benefit uh, he gives me that latitude to be able to go ahead and make a commitment and I haven't been chastised yet you know. <laughs> <laughs> that's great thanks we're going to take a break right now and we'll be back with the second segment of From Both Sides From Both Sides is a production of the Susquehanna Valley Center for Public Policy and is made possible by the support of the Pennsylvania Center for Women and Politics at Chatham University a nonpartisan center devoted to fostering women's public leadership through education, empowerment, and action. The first to focus on women's political involvement in Pennsylvania, the center integrates disciplinary knowledge, civic education, and capacity building while examining the intersection of women and public policy. From Both Sides is also supported as a public service by Saul Ewing LLP a law firm with a 100-year tradition of serving the needs of business, government, education, health care, technology, and manufacturing in our region. Welcome back to From Both Sides. Maura and I are here today with our guest, Jeannie Arnold, and we're talking about women and philanthropy. Jeannie, um, to follow up that conversation, I'm just uh, wondering, uh, we tend to see philanthropists traditionally as men or as couples. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering um, a couple of things. One. Uh, what what comments do you have about why we don't see more women in philanthropy? And I'll also say that certainly when I'm trying to raise money, it's much easier for me to get a man to write a check for a thousand dollars than to get a woman to write a check for a thousand dollars. So, uh, what are your thoughts about that? Well, I think if a, if it's a married couple that you're trying to get something, you know, a donation from, that probably it's the man that is controlling what the what is going to happen, not the woman. And that that is, you know, a, a problem because they women don't always have any control of that, mm -hmm. particularly if they're married to a very wealthy man. Um, that That's just the reality. And then women that are single, that are supporting themselves, may not have the resources and the financial funds to be able to write a check. So you have to kind of know where that woman is and what what they're able to do you know in my situation I mean Ed was always one that he would want to help donate to libraries and colleges basically his philosophy was people that are helping themselves my philosophy is that there's many times you have to help people that can't help themselves mm -hmm. you've got to be the arm that reaches out to lift them up and help them and be a mentor hopefully that they make a change in their life. Not mm -hmm. everybody has had the ability to be able to go to college or, mm -hmm. you know, they just have not been from that environment. Or born in wealth. And born in wealth, yeah. absolutely, mm -hmm. you know. Well, we talked a little bit about um, young people donating over their time, but if a young wo woman were to come to you today and say, how can I, how, where should I start? Mm -hmm. What can I do? What, what kind of advice would you give this young woman in terms of donating time or resources? I think that because of some of the connections and the agencies that I am involved in, I would try to ascertain from that woman, what her, that young woman, what her interests are, what she might want to do. And to me, it's all about networking. 
whether you know you're looking for a cause and trying to raise money it, 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 there is a network like there's certain women I know and so if I'm touched and I know some I know some other women that might help to to basically lead that young person to where she's going to benefit the most and then pr providing some follow-up you know Ed and I have helped many that are trying to improve in, in a career you know it's it's a matter of what they're interested in and where they want to go and then of course making the connection with the organization mm -hmm. or the agency but encouraging them to do something you know if you have this desire then you need to step out there right. and get involved I love that you said you would follow up you you wouldn't just say what do you like okay go over here you would right. want to, you'd be interested in knowing how what they did with that information and and what they're doing with the information Absolutely. I, I think we need more people who would who want to do that follow-up because I think that's encouragement to anybody who's just trying to f find their way in terms of donating time that's uh, right. to an organization and following up with the agency too right is it working because it's got to work for both sides mm -hmm. you know if it doesn't then you know you're it's a waste of time for the agency to put their time and energy into somebody to volunteer and also from the volunteer side mm -hmm. um, how do you think the face of philanthropy would change if more women were involved I personally think that it well I think women can do a lot you know when we do get together and we have a mission we can really move forward um, I, I do believe that there'd be more sensitivity to more 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 overall issues uh, that's my own personal thing just by watching and being involved with men in meetings and um, many times you know I just feel that you know women come they they have a purpose they get right to it to the agenda they don't talk about what happened in the football game you know mm -hmm. I mean that's just the way we I are. do but <laughs> I don't I really don't I'm much more along your lines <laughs> where I want to get get to the point get to the point and then my socialization is after the meeting after the, um, yeah. after yeah, right. the meeting like you get on the agenda you come up with a plan and then afterwards you can go have coffee or have dinner or whatever but you know I, I mean, I just feel women can really get a lot done. Mm -hmm. And Michelle, I want to bring it back to um, something you mentioned at the very beginning, and that is the Boy Scouts of America. Um, you have a soft spot in your uh, philanthropic interests for the Boy Scouts, so you have to explain um, how that came about and, and what exactly you're doing for them. Well, really, it was through my husband, who was uh, has been very involved with the Boy Scouts, and uh, we did get involved in making a big donation to the uh, summit in West Virginia, which is a high adventure camp. It's just unbelievable. And um, also, he, he wanted to get involved with a program we call Scout Reach, which in the poorer neighborhoods where you can't get the scout leaders, that ah. there are funds that are available to help to get the leaders, get the uniforms or whatever. That was really the introduction into the Boy Scouts. And then from there, you know, I've gotten more involved. Uh, we went down this past July to a shooting spree thing with uh, Dr. Robert Gates, who is the retired Secretary of Defense, mm -hmm. who now is the, the national volunteer leader for the Boy Scouts of America. So the more I got involved and started seeing, because I, I, that wasn't really one of my passions, but um, after getting involved in, you know, doing the zip line, you know, down <laughs> there and pistol shooting and rifle, and I started just seeing. You wish you, know, you were a Boy Scout. Yeah. yeah. You yeah. did all that? I did that. You personally did all that. I did yeah. that. It was fun. It when was she really gets fun. involved, she gets involved. Yeah, I got <laughs> it. I got it. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that was just, it was great. And then we just recently made a big commitment. Um, this, this camp down in uh, the summit, down in Bechtel, they had, I think it was the year before last, they had 60,000 scouts. Oh, wow. And the medical facilities were, were tents. And I think there was like a, a, a trailer that was there, but they weren't permanent. And they had, uh, obviously, with a high adventure camp, you're going to have a lot of injuries. A lot of mosquito bites. A lot, yeah. yeah <laughs> mosquito bites, you know, brush burns, I mean, all kinds of problems like that. So now they want to build a permanent facility. And one of the things that really I'm very excited about is Dr. Dr. Gates wants to use that camp for injured warriors when oh, it's wow. not being used oh. for the Boy Scouts. So that really touched both both of us. Mm -hmm. So we've made a big commitment to that. Um, we went and announced our gift, and then 
after the meeting, I was asked to be on the board of the Boy Scouts of America, which is a tremendous honor, really is. Well, I had no idea women were on the board at Boy Scouts of America. There were women uh, back in the early 80s. There were some women on the board. Currently, there aren't. So I will be the only woman on the board. Oh, congratulations. So, yeah. yeah. I'd like to be at one of those board meetings. Yeah. yeah. It would be <laughs> it's all men. Very interesting. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm looking forward to it. I really am. And, and you know, I was very pleased because they asked Ed if he was okay with this, and he was. So, you know, I, I feel very honored. I really do. And I'm looking forward to it. My first meeting will be next week. Okay. Um, well, you know, Jeannie, everybody, no matter what your wealth, does have a limited amount of money. So how is it that you really try to put things in perspective in terms of, I'm sure you get a lot of people asking you mm -hmm. to be involved and to contribute. So how do you really make those determinations? Do you, I know you said some of it you do on your own, some of it you do together, but um, does it just get, the list just get really hard to manage? It, it is a long list that mm -hmm. we've donated to mm -hmm. and, uh, and we're blessed that we can, you know, I, I mean, we really enjoy doing what we're doing. I think that for, for both of us, it is a relationship that ends up building with an organization. It's not just the organization, it's the people. Mm -hmm. And when you really feel like they do care, that you're not just a, a bank, mm -hmm. that you do care about what they're going, you're interested in their mission and their goals, that it becomes something very, very personal. They become friends. Mm -hmm. And those are the organizations that we continue to be very supportive. And obviously, every organization, to keep themselves fresh, is going to have more projects mm -hmm. and more things that they want to do. Um, what I don't like is when you do make a donation, and it's something for an annual you know, contribution, and you don't hear anything mm -hmm. for a year oh. until that time comes up. And then all of a sudden, there's a phone call, will you underwrite such and such? and we need it by you know two days mm -hmm. i mean those that's happened with a couple of organizations that quite frankly we've backed away from mm -hmm. because that's not what it's about mm -hmm. so the organization has to be able to fulfill some of the donors needs mm -hmm. and get to know you as a person uh, the boy scouts is a tremendous example we just recently were in sweden the King of Sweden is the international volunteer. So we were there, we had dinner with the King at the palace. I mean, now that's obviously, you know, there, not every organization can do that. But you feel like you're special. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and we've made a big commitment to the Boy Scouts. Mm -hmm. so we have to the Hershey Med Center. Mm -hmm. We're included in many, many things with Penn State, not only at the hospital, but even the main campus. So. That's, you know, those are the, the organizations you want to continue to, to help. I think that's good advice for any organization or any group of people who are mm -hmm. uh, trying to raise funds and work with donors because yeah. um, you, Donor you, management. you do yeah. want to have a yeah. good relationship yeah. because uh, just as you're important to them, they are, I think we're finding out by today's interview, they're important to you as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. I mean, it becomes part of, if you want to say, like an extended family. Mm -hmm. I mean, both Ed and I, you know, we, we have many, many friends, and it's been because of getting involved with the different organizations and their response to us. Well, what is one of the biggest challenges that you face um, in doing all this work? I mean, it sounds like you couldn't possibly have any time to sleep. So <laughs> what's one of the biggest challenges that you have in doing this kind of work? Well, I think you really hit, hit, hit yeah. it's time management. Right. Uh, because like right now, Ed and I would love to go on a cruise or go somewhere where it's warm. <laughs> and really, you know, we, we, we really are kind of tied up for the, these past couple of weeks between the Boy Scouts and we, we're on the, I'm on the board of Lebanon Valley College. I mean, so if you're really going to commit yourself to an organization and take positions, you have to be, you have to be accountable and you have to be present. So we, you know, we many times can't travel the way that we might want to. Mm -hmm. And that's something we really have to take a look at. 
you know. Well, Michelle and I both have served on, on boards, and nothing is more frustrating than being there, being present, doing your best to help, but having a lot of people who don't show up. Oh, yeah. And it sounds like you put that effort into being, if you've made that commitment and made the, and, and have that obligation that you are going to be there. And I think that's one of the things that young people should know. Don't make the oblig the commitment and not yeah. follow through on it. You have I mean, to. You if have it's to. just your time even, you right. you know, if you make it, then you need to do it. So, well, one of the things I do want to ask you, in addition to the time management and all of the wonderful causes you support, um, I understand you're interested in starting to work on a Broadway play. <laughs> so, so other than all of that work, the all of your work for the good causes, you're also doing some other things that are fun for you. So, I'm interested to hear about that. This is this is so exciting, uh, and it it happened because I was attending a charity event in New York City, at the Lincoln Center, and I was sitting next to these two gentlemen, and uh, it was black tie, you know, and I turned to both of them and asked them what they were what they did and they proceeded to tell me that they had purchased the rights from Paramount to produce the First Wives Club as a Broadway show. Oh, great. So I said, "Oh my gosh, you know, are you looking for investors?" <laughs> and you know, and this was like just a small investment at the time and uh, Paul Lambert who is one of them, he said, oh my gosh, yes we are. And So I went home and Paul called me the next day and he said, um, can I come and see you? So he did and I wrote my check and gave it to him. Uh, what I didn't realize is that they had run out of money to continue to have the rights to do the show with Paramount and my check is what helped them to continue to have the rights. So. I've been very involved, and then um, most recently, you know, Ed, Ed has been, been involved too, uh, to put you know funds in as uh, executive producers to be a part of this. So it's really a lot of fun. We were just in New York City to see um, what they what they've developed so far. The cast is on their way right now to Chicago because it opens in Chicago. A soft opening, I'm learning all these things, mm -hmm. uh, a soft opening February 17th, which during that time things can be changed, the script can be changed based on the audience's reaction, the critics' reviews, but then after that, as of March 11th, that is the official opening, and then after that nothing can be changed. This is wow. union rules or something. But anyway, so this is really exciting, and, and uh, Paramount, one of their criteria was that Holland Dozer and Holland, who are the men that wrote all the great Motown music, like Stop in the Name of Love, Reach Out, Sugar Pie Honey Bunch, oh, they've, yeah. written, yeah, they've written <laughs> songs. What it's, fun. Yeah, it's great. It yeah. really is. So, you know, we, I mean, and that's another reason why we haven't been able to travel, because we went up mm -hmm. to, which was fun. Yeah. We went up to New York and we saw where they are with that. And we'll be going to Chicago in March uh, for the opening. I wish it was a little warmer, but <laughs> well, that's terrific, Jeannie. Thank you so much for joining us. We I think we've learned a lot about yeah. philanthropy, and we've learned a lot about the causes you've supported. And I just want to close this edition of From Both Sides by saying thank you for joining us. And as we all know, as women in Pennsylvania, there's much more that unites us than divides us. Thank you, and I hope you'll join us next time. <laughs>